Hello and welcome. This is teacher Wendy Nelson. I want you to know that we are on track in this season of restoration as believers are now introduced to true priesthood prophecy, to discern prophecy that comes from the throne of God. As God continues to address the false prophetic ministry, we get much insight from Chief Apostle Eric von Andersek's article, The Lies Satan Concealed in the Psyche of Man. Learning to discern how Satan hides in man's own longings and fears opens up these hidden pockets of deception. We're going to look at how Satan has created a system of deception based on truisms that draw on every believer's longing to know that they are significant and that God loves and cares for them. Time doesn't allow for us to go through the whole article, but I will draw out some teaching points to show how Satan's tactic has never changed and how his objective is to cast his own shadow of guilt and shame over your soul and render your faith unacceptable to God. And to let you know that God has opened the door of his covenant priesthood for you to learn what is true prophecy. The first thing I want you to remember is that there are two kingdoms, two frames of knowledge, two sources of power, God or the devil, the kingdom and knowledge of God and the kingdom and knowledge of darkness. We either prophesy from one or the other. So in testing prophecy, it has to do with testing the frame of knowledge and the source of power. Are the words drawing sympathy from the flesh to confirm the fallen nature of the flesh? Or are the words drawn from the foundation of truth to confirm Jesus Christ, to encourage believers to follow the rhythm of the Spirit? Did you know that all true prophecy confirms Jesus Christ and his covenant? False prophecy confirms a deep-seated desire to be part of that reality. Satan knows this and exploits that desire. Prophecy is supposed to be a return or a reciprocation of the knowledge of Jesus Christ to God. We honour God in prophesying by returning the gift of his Son to him in the utterance or prophecy of his knowledge. Which truth is the light of the soul? Revelation 19.10 reads, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So you see, it's not the testimony of self, the struggle of self, the psychology of self that weighs heavy upon the heart, but the prophecy of Jesus Christ. The Lord ministered a word to Apostle Eric to make clear this mixing of psychology with prophecy. The word is psychophysy, for it draws from the knowledge of the world and from the record of man. How do we spot false prophecy? It's easy to spot false prophecy because it focuses on you, on a progressive reality. It's elusive and ambiguous and directs faith to obtain a witness or confirmation from the flesh. God is breaking deep-seated religious traditions that feel right simply because they are tied to the record of one's own soul being the record of the flesh. Now the flesh is not the body of the flesh, but the imprint of God within, the God code, the moral code, and the signature map of the soul, which Satan has corrupted with his knowledge to bring forth the fruits of iniquity, which are his tools. So there are five facets of the flesh, the God code, the moral code, the signature map of the soul, the knowledge of the world, and the tools of iniquity. The flesh is also called the record of man or the old man, which must be put off in order for the new man or Christ to be put on. There's a great series of teaching on the second eighth week website about the flesh. So let's go to the article now and see how Satan concealed his lie within your subconscious. As God continues to come against the name it, claim it dogma in this season of transition to the covenant of Jesus Christ, he is revealing something that is so deeply concealed in the psyche of man that until now it was impossible to detect. Apostle Eric puts it this way, Have you ever turned over a large rock on a patch of land you're clearing? 
Hidden underneath that rock, out of sight, is an invisible kingdom of spiders, bugs and snakes. Once you turn that rock over, you can clearly see what a moment ago was concealed. That's what God is doing. He's turning over Satan's promise to allow you to get a clear view of what he's been hiding from you. End of quote. There is a clear and powerful connection between the name it, claim it dogma and the doctrine of substitutionism, which is the foundation of the church today. And I'll come back to that in a little. Apostle Eric goes on to call the name it, claim it dogma a stronghold. So we see three important words. We see conceal, dogma and stronghold which are helpful for our understanding as to why God is challenging the false prophetic ministry and why unconverted believers, being those outside of covenant priesthood, have bought into and strongly defend the lie. I looked up the word dogma, which I googled. Dogma is a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true, meaning that it is not able to be denied or disputed. False prophecy is taught to believers through the false prophetic ministry as dogma because of the doctrine of substitutionism which centers on truisms which bears witness to self and not on the truth of God which bears witness to Jesus Christ. So there's a distinction that's made there. This is not the case for those who have transitioned into covenant with God received the knowledge and instruction from the steward, Apostle Eric, and are functioning in the holy and spiritual priesthood of Jesus Christ. These are those who have the scale of truth for discernment and who follow the record of Christ, not the record of self. These are those who prophesy Christ. 1 Peter 2.5 Apostle Eric goes on to say that there are three fronts where this dogma manifests. I'm going to look at the first, and we will look at two examples of how Satan presents his twisted logic, a word the Lord ministered to me regarding Satan's counsel. Twisted meaning perverted, corrupted, distorted, unhealthy, or wicked. So the first one is you can make God act on your behalf. Now you may be thinking, I don't follow the name it and claim it dogma. But I want you to know that there is a connection between that dogma and the psyche of man, which is what false prophecy is comprised of. This will become clearer as we continue to examine this connection, and you will be able to see that although you might not think you prescribe to the underlying dogma, its effect is heard on the lips of ministers who prophesy and teach their congregation to prophesy to man's needs and desires. In an attempt to get God to move, to fulfill these needs and desires. This dogma has subtly infiltrated even the most conservative branches of Christianity today. So there's one word that sums up Satan's strategy and resultant vulnerability, and that, dear listener, is the word lack. L-A-C-K, lack. He makes you first aware of a perceived lack and then makes a seemingly reasonable suggestion of how you can rectify that lack. So let's go back to the article. Satan's lure for you is the same as for Adam and for Jesus, namely to make God act on your behalf. In other words, it's up to you to make God move. And that is a premise behind speaking declarations. The belief is that God will act once you speak, that God follows your word. In this apostolic season, God is laying bare Satan's promises and revealing why Satan has been so successful in keeping his lie hidden for so long. The devil came at Adam and Jesus from the same angle, speaking about the things that appeared to be lacking from their experience and promising that soon things will change. All they had to do was make God move on their behalf. In fact, the devil made it seem as if God were waiting with open arms for them to step out. The devil came at Adam and spoke to him about what he didn't have, the knowledge of good and evil, and suggested that in that place of need and desire, that there was something Adam could do to bridge the gap. 
suggesting that in fact God was waiting for him to act, in essence saying, if you want God to fill this need that you have, then you have to take action. You've got to eat the fruit of this tree and you will have what you want. I want to pause there and ask, what didn't Adam see? Adam saw what Satan wanted him to see, which was his twisted logic, being that God would reward his initiative and excuse his transgression. Adam didn't see that Satan was addressing his vulnerability, being his desire for the things God had planned to give him. Adam didn't see how Satan's suggestion of lack made him vulnerable to take matters into his own hands, to fulfill that desire and thereby transgress against God's commandments or set activity. Going back to the article, the issue was never about Adam having what God promised, and this is really important. The issue was about believing the devil's account about God's promise. That's when Adam perceived that he lacked, and this is when he became vulnerable to Satan's wiles. Know this, Satan always speaks to marry your desires to God's will to impart to the mind an urgency to initiate an act to get God to move on your behalf as if it were God's idea. When defending this, the false doctrine about making prophetic declarations, you're asked to think about the things you feel that are lacking in your life. The areas where you don't feel whole, like broken relationships and broken promises. And then you are led to envision God fixing and rebuilding that area in your life giving you a chance to start anew, and then speaking that out aloud as if you are repeating a proclamation from heaven. But you're not. You're repeating Satan's proclamation. Prophetic ministers do the same thing today. They approach faith from the position of lack, asking believers if they are tired of the devil interfering with their day-to-day -day life, blaming the devil for things not panning out the way they had imagined they would, telling believers that they have a right to change circumstances by releasing prophetic decrees, enchanting scripture, promising remarkable changes. To them, faith is all about ironing out the wrinkles in their day. This knowledge is false and does not bear the anointing because the Holy Spirit will not assist the knowledge of this world. In fact, it is an abomination to God because it does not work to his glory, it does not build his house, this is not his joy. Prophet Jonathan recently in his, in his recent teaching on the article, Faith is not a conniption fit, brings out how the soul seeks its own peace and rest by naming and claiming blessings, shouting scriptures at the devil who is thought to be keeping blessings from you, using scripture for protection, binding the devil and prophesying God's blessings into one's life. We are called according to God's purpose. The purpose of God has to do with the covenant that he provided for us. If you're keeping the terms of the covenant, you are flowing with the gifts of grace within your priesthood. You have put on the garments of righteousness in the priesthood of Jesus Christ and experience of that grows and increases every day. That's what you're relating to and talking about in the body of his knowledge. So what was Satan's objective? Well, it was to bring faith, and I'm quoting again, to bring faith under the shadow of his guilt and shame. He wants your faith to reflect his separation from God. He knew God's desire was to lift Adam on high, so he made Adam fall by taking ownership of God's desire for Adam to redirect it with lack to make Adam act to cover that perceived need. How did that pan out for Adam? Well, after heeding Satan's counsel, Adam hid from God and thus God teaches us that Satan's wiles are concealed in the nakedness of the soul. And that's where he'll come at you. So let's look at Jesus. And I'm continuing on with, with the article. The devil came to Jesus with the same bait to lure Jesus to put God into action. After all, did not God say this and that? Suggesting that Jesus jump off the pinnacle of the temple and God would save him. Because that's what God does, doesn't he? Make the jump your declaration. 
The difference between Jesus and Adam is that Jesus did not capitulate to the devil. He was in the flesh, but not to act from a place of lack, because he did not lack anything. The inclination of the natural man is to qualify our weakness for strength, and that's where Satan gives his witness to validate it. But God teaches us that his daily dose of grace is our strength and the, the new place from which we labor, the activity of faith with the knowledge and tools of Christ. Jesus did not place faith in the evidence of the flesh. Jesus operated from a different reality, that of his own record, which he came to establish for our confidence and faith to show us this way of righteousness and holiness that is in him. He refused the knowledge of Satan because it was not that of the anointing of truth, and it came from Satan's own lack and weakness, which he wished to transfer to Jesus. End of quote. Now I want to just look at the connection between the lie and the doctrine of substitutionism, which I said I would come back to. There is a clear and powerful connection between the name it and claim it dogma and the doctrine of substitutionism, which is a foundation of the church today. Substitutionism is unsound doctrine and therefore creates a false religious system and a barrier to faith by allowing Satan's lie to remain concealed in your psyche, which only truth can reveal. Because this doctrine and dogma of name it and claim it is taught by the authority of a minister, it's accepted as being from God by those without the knowledge of truth for discernment, and it resonates with a deep-seated desire within, and feeling true, it is defended as the truth. Remember stronghold? This defense of false doctrine and practice becomes a stronghold, meaning a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. Remember concealed dogma stronghold. I'm going to read from the um, Apostolic Calling and Anointing, page 40. This is a book by Apostle Eric von Andersek. The teaching that Jesus is our substitute is the foundation of the false religious system. Under this umbrella, believers are taught to approach God with ideas they found in the Bible. They learn to substitute an idea for salvation. For example... So God wants a relationship with me. So God wants me to be fruitful in his kingdom. So God loves me and will care for me. So I can operate in spiritual gifts. The problems with substitutionism are many. For starters, the idea about having a relationship with God, being fruitful in his kingdom, partaking of his love and care and operating in his spiritual gifts have been aligned to the carnal mind of the natural man rather than the heart of God. Now all you have are truisms. I'm interjecting here for a, for a minute with a few of these truisms I found on Instagram this morning and there are many of these. There are myriads of them. God's plan will always be greater and more beautiful than your disappointments. Ryan the Strange God is opening new things in the spirit that will never be shut. Doug Addison Whatever you have been believing God for, get ready to receive double. This is your season of double portion and supernatural inheritance. Paula White Cain Look for your miracle now. Your suddenly has just happened, Prophet Jeff Larson. Here again we can see psychophysy, prophecy that comes from one's own heart. Can you see why the word is helpful for you to understand an ungodly union, whereby psychology of one's mind and heart is joined to prophecy? Remember I said that there is a knowledge of God, being the fullness of his truth, then we have the knowledge of the world being Satan's copycat of truth, using that which is true, but not the truth. The knowledge of this world um, creates an addiction, and I want to look at how that addiction is broken. When the soul is fed truisms and not the truth, 
It's like living on a diet of junk food. It tastes so good. It creates an appetite for more and eventually an addiction. So while your body needs good nutritious food, like your soul needs truth, when you're feeding an addiction, discernment is by the taste buds, by the senses. There we see the imagination, which demands more of the same. It's only when the body becomes a beast or sick that change is sought. And false knowledge feeds the soul with many false promises that make faith vain and the soul barren. We call that exigent faith, when faith goes into a crisis. An addiction is not easily broken, but I want you to know that God is helping to cut the cords that bind you to the wrong system to come and learn what true prophecy is. As the church is awakening, the light of true prophecy is breaking the spell of false prophecy. The Lord will teach the willing and empower each choice of faith with his wisdom, knowledge and understanding which embodies his grace. When God transitioned the church back to the covenant knowledge, stewardship, priesthood and tools of Jesus' covenant, faith again followed the right path, the record of Jesus Christ, which is a true faith of the righteous, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So in closing, I want to share a word ministered to me for this teaching, down tools. Cambridge Dictionary defines down tools as to refuse to continue working, especially because you are not satisfied with your pay or working conditions. In other words, it means to strike. This action is also called industrial action, which I like, because it implies no more laboring under unacceptable conditions. Now is the time of change. If you are ready to down tools on Satan's exploitation of your faith, and you are ready and willing to learn from his steward and government who he has raised up as your refuge, and learn to prophesy Christ from the foundation of truth, then he will prove that his deliverance is in the record of Christ, his knowledge, and his tools. Well, thank you for listening, and may the grace of God be with you all.